I'm Dr. Peter Crapo with the Fox Center for Vision Restoration, and I'm here with Dr. Keith Martin, uh, Professor of Ophthalmology from the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. And uh, Keith, uh, maybe as a start, could you tell us a bit about uh, your background and, and uh, the research that you do and why it is that you work in the field of regenerative ophthalmology? Sure, Peter. Well, I've always been interested in, in how the brain works and I, I started out my career studying neuroscience and before moving into clinical medicine mm -hmm. and so I always thought I wanted to be a, a neurologist and I started training as a neurologist but I realized quite quickly that uh, the treatments that were available for a lot of these conditions were really not there and I got a little bit frustrated by that and I moved across to ophthalmology where I thought we had absolutely great treatments both surgical and medical for a lot of the conditions that we treat so so I became an ophthalmologist and um, but what I realized as I moved um, through ophthalmology jobs that actually there was a lot of unmet need with the ophthalmology patients that we, we have. And I work in glaucoma um, and I treat kids and adults with glaucoma and we still see very many patients who are either blind due to these diseases or despite our best efforts are continuing to go blind. And so what motivates me now really is the, is the patients because I see them every day in the clinic, um, those that have lost vision and those that really we've got very little more to offer. And they're always asking me, is there hope? You know, am I going to be able to see my own kids? The younger, the younger ones will ask. Yes. And that's a very strongly motivating thing. And so, so I combine the clinical work that I do with um, lab work. And it's all focused on trying to develop new treatments um, for the diseases that we really can't treat with the, the, the techniques that we have at present. I think a, a great uh, unmet need as far as understanding diseases like glaucoma and, and then being able to uh, do more than just a preventive sort of uh, treatment. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we, it's very important to understand the mechanisms um, as you work to develop new treatments. But I think one of the things that helps um, for those of us who work both on the clinical and the, um, the, the research side is to keep the questions that we ask scientifically relevant to the new treatments. So, so there's always a tendency, sometimes in the work that we do, to pursue things in more and more detail and look right. at the finer and finer mechanisms and the, the beautiful mechanisms of how, how cells die. But actually, right. I'm always trying to turn things around and saying, well, where can we actually intervene? Is there, is there a potential treatment in this piece of knowledge that we've gained about how, how, how cells die in glaucoma? Can we use that? to develop new new therapies. Right, keeping your eye on the clinical side and, and keeping everything that you do relevant I think to that that's, clinical that's, application. I think that's the key. We don't always succeed in, in doing that, but right. every, you know, when I talk to the guys in the lab, you know, every now and again we, we, we focus back on, on, on that because I guess the goal that we mustn't lose sight of is that the, the, the patient is, is the driving force behind all of this work and uh, that's what gives it meaning. As I understand, early on in your research, uh, you, you looked at, and you may still be currently doing this, you looked at uh, the use of retinal explants as a testing uh, sort of test bed for evaluating therapies or potential therapies. And, uh, and what do you see as, as maybe um, the greatest benefits of that as a system, as a model? And, and what are some of the drawbacks? What, what, uh, do you see as maybe some of the shortcomings? Sure, well, retinal explants, which really means taking little pieces of retinal tissue and putting it in a dish and manipulating it in some way, um, is a very useful and very powerful technique for some aspects of what we do. So, so working in whole animals, um, the, it's, it's actually very difficult sometimes to manipulate the conditions in a very precise way or to measure uh, factors that are being released or concentrations of factors that are potentially important in pathways. And one of the important things about um, using retinal explants is that you can control the conditions of the experiment very precisely. Now, right. now a further benefit is it enables us to greatly reduce the number of animal experiments that we have to do. I think it's uh, important, I think, that we're, we're responsible um, when we're doing experiments that involve animals. And I think there's a real need um, and an expectation that we will reduce, replace and refine uh, the experiments that we do to reduce animal use and so that's another benefit of using the explants. Now, now there are problems with this approach and uh, one particular problem is that when it comes to studying retinal ganglion cells, once you remove that retinal tissue from uh, the eye, then you have cut 
all of the axons, all of the connections um, between those cells. And that's a, a potent stimulus for these cells to undergo apoptosis, which is programmed cell, cell death. So you're dealing with a, a, a pretty heavily injured population of, of retinal right. ganglion cells. And even should they survive, there's still some degeneration that occurs. And that is correct. So, yeah. so, so it is very useful in some ways, but we find it helpful for, for example, for high throughput screening of drugs that are potentially neuroprotective. Right. Can you move forward to sort of human studies on the basis of what you find in explants? No, you, you can't. Right. You, you need to, to do move some preclinical modeling. Uh, yeah. Preclinical modeling, and, and, and then, but it, it speeds up the process um, and it enables you to uh, look in more detail at very specific um, pathways. What do you see as, as some of the, the strengths and the limitations of retinal explants and, and, uh, and then uh, limitations going forward moving uh, your findings using retinal explants toward uh, clinical uh, implementation? Of that, I, that idea, those potential therapeutics. Well, retinal explants, which involves taking small pieces of retina and culturing them in a dish, this is a very useful technique for exploring some aspects of how cells die in diseases like glaucoma and how you can potentially influence that and protect cells against damage. It speeds up the process because it allows us to um, do a, a series of experiments very, very quickly using small pieces of, of tissue, um, but it's not a replacement for other types of preclinical model because, for example, these explants, when you remove them from the eye, the axons, which are the connections to other cells, are cut, um, and that this is a very a strong injury to the cells, so they're, they're, they're compromised in that way. So, so what we learn from the explant models, we then take forward into other preclinical models to help us develop new treatments. Right. So the cells aren't necessarily in their native condition, but they still give you an indication of, of what uh, cues they need in order to recover function if there's damage to the eye that's absolutely right. within and, uh, a, a patient's eye. That, that, that's, exa that's absolutely right. And, uh, and any treatment that can rescue retinal ganglion cells in the context of such a severe injury as being taken out and put in a dish is um, often quite a, quite a powerful uh, approach to use um, in, in uh, potential treatments. So it can essentially point the direction of, of things that are worth following up on versus things that, that may not work as well. That's, that's exactly right. So what do you see as the potential for stem cells in treating some of the uh, ophthalmological diseases that we see and that we're, we're struggling to overcome? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot of excitement about the potential use of um, stem cells to treat a lot of different conditions at present and a lot of, a lot of hype really and uh, yes. I think as, as scientists and clinicians working in this area we've got to be careful to manage the expectations of, of people and not promise um, too much too quickly. We're already seeing and uh, there are clinics uh, being set up around the world that are offering treatments that are really not very well validated as yet and uh, I think we have a responsibility to do things better and to actually prove that these treatments work. Now when it comes to the eye I think the eye is actually a fantastic model for working uh, with potential stem cell treatments. Now, some diseases are easier than others. For example, I think stem cell treatments for macular degeneration are very likely to occur within a small number of years. Those clinical trials are already starting. The reason why that type of disease is treatable first is that retinal pigment epithelial cells, which are the cells that are affected in macular degeneration, are a relatively simple sort of cell. So they just grow in a single layer. They don't make any complex connections with other cells. Right. And they have a very specific job to do. And so in replacing them is relatively easy. Yes. When it comes to retinal ganglion cells in conditions like glaucoma, the task is a lot harder because these cells have to make long projections to the brain, form complex connections within the brain. So it's a much more challenging task. But I'm, I'm really excited about what is happening in the macular degeneration field with retinal pigment epithelial cell uh, transplantation, those cells can be very easily surprisingly derived from, from yes. embryonic stem cells. Relative to other cells. Relative to other types of cells, but it's uh, one of the odd things um, about what stem cells do is that 
when you neglect them almost in culture and overgrow them, they have a tendency to uh, become pigmented and take on many of the characteristics. It's almost their default. Oh, it's almost yeah. their default, which is uh, very fortuitous for us. Yes. Um, yeah. But uh, now, uh, now to follow up uh, something that you said, why do you see the eye as a particularly advantageous system for um, investigating stem cells? So the, the eye has a number of advantages. It's the only directly observable part of the central nervous system. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see what's going on. And we have probably more highly evolved techniques for assessing structure and function of the eye than any other part of the body. Right. Some other specialties might take issue with that. But I think that's, that really is, is true. We can no, it's a, it's a two-way window. Right? That, that's so, right. Yeah. And, uh, and, w and we, can, we can assess at the cellular level already with, with equipment that isn't in the, the research lab. It's equipment that's sitting in our clinics every day. Right. We can see individual photoreceptors uh, within, within uh, the eye. We can see transplanted cells. Potentially, so so it has the advantage of, of being uh, very easy to to measure and assess. It's relatively small. Mm -hmm. It's relatively isolated, um, and both of those are advantages when it comes to um, repair. Um, gets around the problems of, of systemic complications. Um, obviously, we have to be aware of the, the risks of um, tumors forming. Yes. But the discreteness of the eye and its easy accessibility to the different compartments that we wish to deliver cells to um, and our ability to assess its structure and function um, make it a, a really a wonderful model to work with. Right. It also, uh, I think, uh, you can speak to this more probably, but it has its own inherent uh, stem cell population, at least within the retina, the retinal stem cells, where uh, you have sort of a, a built-in stem cell that you can study in the context of eye disease. That's right, and then there, there, there are many types of cell within the eye, particularly, particularly in the, the, the cornea, but also in the retina, um, where there are populations of cells um, that uh, have stem-like qualities. Now, it's interesting, as, as we have um, developed, um, that we have lost the ability that some fish and amphibians have to actually regenerate the retina. So if you take a, a, a teleos fish or an amphibian and you injure its retina, it will uh, repair. Right. Um, and spontaneously. Spontaneously, and somewhere along the line, um, mammals and uh, you know primates have lost that ability. But often, in that sort of circumstance where where an ability has been lost, much of the um, machinery, if you like, that facilitates that repair is still there, right. somewhere under the hood. We just and need to find the switch. We need to find the switch, yeah. and um, and so I think. That's a field that is really growing at the moment, is, is looking at mechanisms of endogenous repair. So, so not just transplanting uh, right. stem cells to try and have an effect, but actually working out how to switch on the cells that are already there right. um, and to control it. Now, there are risks within that because in adults, stem cells are very likely to be switched off for a reason. Yes. Um, and so I think we've got to be careful what we wish for. And we've got to understand a lot about what those switches do um, and how to control them. Right, right. You want to make sure that when you switch the machine on, you can control what the machine does that's exactly after right. you switch it exactly on. That's exactly right. Yes. And there are ways that we can do that. There are types of promoter, for example, um, that are inducible. So we can give a, we can uh, potentially give a, a drug like an antibiotic, tetracycline or, or tamoxifen, right. um, that can switch different genes uh, on and off. And that's an example of how we can have a safety valve, if you like, for, for, for some of these approaches if, if things are not going. A little bit of control, uh, yeah. just as a, yeah, Absolutely. As a catch. That's Excellent. great. Thanks for joining us, Keith. I'd like to ask, just as a, a last question here, um, there's a lot of exciting things happening that, uh, that we can see in the field of regenerative ophthalmology. What are the things that, that you see as the most exciting and uh, what are the upcoming technologies that, that uh, you look forward to uh, being able to watch develop over the course of the next five or ten years? Yeah. Well, I, I think this is a fantastic time to be working in, in regenerative ophthalmology. Absolutely. The field is really coming alive um, and we're not just uh, promising uh, treatments for many years in the future now, we're actually um, starting the clinical trials for certain diseases. And I think that's the most exciting um, thing that's going on now. Um, I'm particularly excited to see the results of the trials with um, RPE cells derived from human embryonic stem cells and whether these really will um, 
have the ability to improve visual function in patients with, with macular degeneration and other conditions. I think if that's proven to be successful, it will really help the field um, to, to take off for other applications as well. I think I'm sure this is the right candidate for the initial studies, um, and I'm sure it's the right way to go. Um, and I'm just really excited that the, the whole um, way in which researchers are approaching this um, problem appears to be right. The, we're often limited in terms of advances by the technology that we, we have. The technology is now there. We know enough about how these cells um, can be uh, differentiated and, and controlled. Right. Um, we've got the models in which we can assess whether or not it, it works. Now is the time to start moving across into the, 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 the clinic. So I think we live in, in exciting times. Yeah, essentially you see it as a, a foot in the door and, and uh, as that is successful then the door will open wider. That's, that's the and, hope. And we're at that point. That's the dream. Great. Well, thank you for joining us, Keith. Thank you, Peter.